Hi people, this is Glenno speaking. Uh, welcome to uh, Flat Earth Discussion. Okay. Uh, today uh, I'm doing this video when, uh, when I got some spare time on my hands with no one, no one around. I thought I'd do this and finish it off. Because uh, when I did my first video, I uh, had said to some people that I'd, I was hoping to get another video out uh, by last week. And that sort of didn't happen because I uh, found that I had a lot more research to go into. Okay? As will become evident as you keep watching. Alright? Now I'm going to deal with two different topics uh, in the course of this video. Now I could have split it up into two different videos, but I decided to lump it both together. So uh, bear with me, okay? Alright, so the, the first topic I sort of want to deal with is uh, uh, the, the accusations that are thrown at the uh, Flat Earth formula of f for finding uh, curvature drop uh, 8 inches by miles squared. I want to have a look at that, uh, the accusations against that, and show how uh, uh, they're not right and how the uh, approximation is pretty good. Okay, and then the second part, I'll be dealing with uh, local gravity, you know, because the Earth's spinning right, rotating. Uh, it's more of an oblate spheroid, according to the theory. And as a consequence, uh, the, the equator is bulging and the poles are flattened. And as a consequence of that, gravity is lighter at uh, the equator than it is at the poles. And as a consequence of this, uh, then the theory goes that uh, things will lay, weigh less at the equator than they do at the poles. Okay. All right. So as as you could, as you know, I've done a lot of as I said, I've done a lot of research. Whereas you know, there's a lot of people out there who are trying to debunk flat Earth, and they do a lot of research. They say, but they're looking at uh, you know how to debunk flat Earth uh, websites, and they're pretty much coming up with the same rubbish. Okay. And it sounds to me like they're just getting stuff from these kinds of websites. And as you notice, some of these aren't even uh, atheist websites. They're actually Christian websites trying to debunk Flat Earth. So it's not just a Christian thing, this Flat Earth thing. Compare it to my research, it's all handwritten. There's a lot, lot of work that's gone into this. So uh, just hang in there, okay? <laughs> all right, so the two frequent accusations that are directed at the Flat Earth curvature drop formula is one, it's not accurate. And two, it's only accurate up to 100 miles. Okay, so we'll have a look at this. Now, I can't think of any uh, flat earthers who would claim that it's anything other than an approximation. Whereas the scientific community would be saying, well, approximations aren't scientific. You can't use them. Well, how about pi? Pi is only an approximation, right? For example, if we take the mean radius of Earth and then we multiply it by 2 pi to different uh, decimal places, uh, we get these different numbers, right? Um, so for 3,959 miles, if we multiply that by uh, 2 by 3.14, we get 24,862.52 miles. And if we go to the next uh, two decimal places, we get 24,874.397 miles. So the more decimal places you get, the the lot the bigger the the number will get. But then, eventually, because of the decimal places, they will, uh, you you will end up rounding up to a a a a, 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 a good approximation, a good approximate number, right? So um, but the reason why uh, it's only an approximation is because you're trying to fit a, a triangle into a circle, right? I mean, as Euclid would say, cause triangles. That's the problem. That's why it's only an approximation. And he wouldn't be the only person who's tried to, like, fit squares or triangles into round holes, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and another r reason, another approximation is... Uh, you get this dude called Bill Nye saying there's way more stars than grains of sand on every beach in the world put together. Now he reckons he's counted, but anyway, <laughs> he hasn't really. But but he acts like he has. <laughs> I 
have a look at what this Australian dude's done. Use estimations, right, to find out how many stars there are than how many grains of sand there are, right, in order to come up with his theory of how many, uh, uh, how many grains of sand compared to stars in the sky. And he admits that he uses, it's, it's estimations or approximations, <laughs> yet he calls himself scientific, right? <laughs> and here we have uh, Bill Nye, he's saying he's on Logan's Beach in Warrnambool, saying he's there to count the sand. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't use approximations. I mean, that'd be almost like looking at... Uh, Australia then looking at uh, Japan and UK and saying there's more people on in Australia because it's bigger all right then you find out there's only 24.4 million people in, a, in Australia compared to 126 million in Japan and 65.4 million in the UK okay then you have a look at this and which ones are correct you know they can't even get the radius right you know, of their oblate spheroid. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> all right, so this is the formula that they use, right? And what they don't show you or concentrate on is the trigs, um, which I've circled here. But uh, I don't think they claim that it's even 100% accurate. It's just an approximation. That's the old version, and then they've updated the version to give it a up to 3,959 miles. Um, and you can see the Triggs version uh, down the bottom there, right? And uh, so we're going to use those two, the eight, eight, eight inches by mile squared. <clears throat> and then we're also going to compare it to the Triggs formula. We're also going to compare it to this dude. He's, he's, he's saying that flat earth is math is wrong, right? Eight inches per mile squared, it's wrong. He's, that's what he's saying. And this is his approximation, right? Drop equals the square root of... Uh, radius squared plus distance squared minus the radius. So we're going to have a look at that. Then we're going to compare it to this geometry that I got off, uh, which is, which a lot of um, curvature formulas use, this sort of uh, thing. So we're, we're going to be interested <clears throat> in uh, four main measurements here to do with drop, okay? Okay, so the actual parts we're going to be looking at are um, M, uh, N, D, which is, is the drop, and C, which is that angle in the middle, which is A plus B equals C. Um, M is uh, the sine of C times the radius. Uh, to find out N, it's uh, 2 times the sine of C divided by 2 times the radius. Uh, the drop is the square root of uh, N squared minus M squared. And, of course, C... That angle in the middle, uh, we take the C, which is the distance, the little c. We divide that by uh, the circumference, um, and then we multiply that by 360 for 360 degrees. So that's how we work out those um, the, those lengths and that that angle. Okay. So we're going to be looking at these, and. Uh, uh, we're going to look at that drop because the rest, the other, the other parts of the equation, they they look at the height that is uh, hidden, okay, which is y, the y over in the right hand corner there. Um, these are the ang the the angles and the uh, distances we're going to be looking at. All right, so let's take a look at the following two formulas and compare them with the approximation. Okay, we're going to have a look at this and uh, we're going to see if how accurate they are, they are, and then we're going to compare it to uh, um, my geometry, all right? Okay, let's do it over some small distances. So we're doing it over 49.27 miles. Uh, the 8-inch formula gives us 1,618.3552666 feet, right? The square root formula gives us... Uh, uh, 1618.70137 feet, right? And uh, as you can look at the other equations and my own geometry, you'll notice, if you pause the video, you'll see that uh, drop kick here is, I'll call him drop kick or dipshit, his square root formula does happen to be a bit closer, right? Now we'll look at 63.71 miles and uh, drop kicks is still closer to uh, the geometry, okay? But uh, we're gonna go a bit bigger, 
I'll get you to pause the video and just do the maths and look at the numbers yourself, okay? We'll go bigger and uh, now, uh, as you can see, over 119 miles, drop kicks uh, formula is a bit closer still than uh, the 8 inches by mile squared to the actual geometrical uh, equation, okay? But uh, we will go even bigger than this, okay? I'll have a look. And then we look at 147 miles. Again, it's a better approximation than dipshits, okay? <laughs> it's, it's a much better approximation. It's actually closer to uh, the geometry, okay? And then we uh, look at even a bigger number, 243 miles. Dipshits is, is off, okay? It's off, whereas uh, the 8 inches is a pretty good approximation, okay? It's even closer to the actual geometry, okay? So, actual, it's a, so it's a good approximation at 243 miles compared to his. Then we look at 749 miles. And uh, again, the 8 inches put by mile squared is actually closer to the geometrical uh, result than uh, dipshits. Okay, it's even closer than his to the actual right number. All right, now let's go even silly. 2,473 miles. And as you can see here, dipshits uh, f square root formula doesn't even come close to the actual number compared to the uh, 8 inches by mile squared. Okay, so for 2,473 miles, you get a big difference between these two formulas, uh, three formulas, right? And it looks like the 8 inches by mile squared is actually closer over longer distances than his silly formula, all right? Drop kick, right? <laughs> so drop kick's approximation seems more accurate over shorter distances, but the 8 by mile squared is definitely a good approximation for longer distances. And of course, as you can see by this, I mean, over a 90 degree angle, uh, you're not going to be able to see anything past a 90, 90 degree angle anyway. So is this correct? Uh, no, it's bullshit. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at uh, local gravity and international trade next. Uh, the reason why I'm focusing on, on this, focusing on this is because uh, other people have done stuff, <clears throat> you know, have answered other questions like Adam's truth journey here. He's he's looked at uh, how sunsets work on a flat Earth, right? As you can see, uh, the further away behind the refraction sheet that he's pulled his lighter, the, the lower the flame and seems to be, and even even the lighter itself seems to disappear, even though it's on a flat plane, right on the table. So. Uh, you know, there's no point going over what other people have said, okay? Um, I wanted to find my own niche, all right? But he's done a good job here. He pulls away the sheet and he shows the light is still there. And then you got people that take on NASA like, you know, Flat Earth Arsehole. You know, I don't need to take on them. And then you've got people like Antarctic Warrior here and uh, see how he shared my video and it's got over... 1100 views beautiful yeah i'm not going to go over the same sorts of stuffs i'd rather do my own stuff and here we've got uh some of the basis for what uh uh scientists base their so-called globe theory on you know uh the work by isaac newton talking about different gravity and and uh he's talking about how uh the, uh, the 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 equator is bulging and uh, f the poles are are uh, squashed, you know, because he's compared it to Jupiter. So he's looked at Jupiter and he's seen uh, that observed that um, it's squashed and and at the poles and bulging at its equator. So we must be the same. That's what he sort of come to. And then he talks about. Uh, how it's <clears throat> the latitude, you know, 
uh, and the, the increase of weight at different latitudes, you know. So passing from the equator to the poles is nearly the first sign of double the latitude or which comes to the same thing as the square of the right sign of the latitude, all right? So that's what he's talking about here. He's saying that uh, f between the equator and the pole that there's a loss of a loss of weight between the poles and the equator. And here he's talking about the accelerated force, you know, and talking about the weight in different regions and talking about elevation in higher regions, how elevation even impacts uh, gravity, right? This so-called thing, you know, all based on pendulums, okay? And so he's always going to say, cause local gravity. <laughs> so I looked up some local gravity stuff, right? Uh, got this dude, he's asked uh, an astronomer, astronomer, you know, seventh grade student, he's asked him, you know, is it true that you're way less at the uh, equator than at the poles? And this dude said, yeah, you're actually right, yeah, because of centrifugal force. But then he admits there that centrifugal force is a fictitious force and it's got to do with the rotating frame of reference. And then we've got some other calculations to show uh, what standard gravity is and stuff and some other things to do with an oblate spheroid and it says with the radius at the equator slightly larger at the radius at the poles that's what he's trying to say okay so let's have a look at the local gravity formula all right Okay, so let's have a look at um, this local gravity formula and its breakdown, okay? So if we uh, look at the first part, um, as uh, G, which is gravity, my, or represents local gravity, equals uh, 9.780327 um, times 1 plus 0 0.005 3024 times the sine of L, which is squared, um, Minus 0 0.0000058 times the sine of uh, 2 times the latitude, and that's squared. Okay, that's the first part. That's the international gravity formula, all right, of 1980. It's meant to uh, determine gravity at a given latitude where L is the latitude, all right. Uh, the second part is uh, minus uh, 3.086 times 10 to the power of. Uh, negative six and then you times that by the height all right this is the fac or the free air correction which is uh, meant to correct for height or elevation all right so let's uh have a look at this okay we'll put this on a blade spheroids we've got the original theory on the left it gives the uh, north pole at 90 degrees uh what they say in um those articles i showed you is that uh, at the north pole and the south pole the uh, gravitational acceleration is 9.832 meters per second uh, squared at the equator, which is at zero degrees. It gives it uh, the gravitational acceleration is 9.78033 meters per second squared. And then we go to 45 degrees uh, latitude um, plus or minus the equator. We get a, a standard gravity of 9.80665 meters per second squared. Now, if we actually use the uh, calculations, uh, it, it does re represent this pretty accurately. I mean, you go and have a look at the North Pole, uh, 90 degrees, and it's 2 metres elevation, and we're talking about like 1 to 2 metres thick of ice on top of uh, water, okay? Mm. So uh, that, that, that gives us uh, 9.8321258417 metres per second squared, uh, gravity ex gravitational acceleration. And uh, if you have a pause this video and have a look at all the arrests, you can work this all out yourselves as well. And you can see that going by this, it does sort of represent quite accurately the uh, the uh, gravitational acceleration uh, at given latitudes and elevations of a, an oblate spheroid in a rotating frame of reference. So theoretically, it works, but does it work in reality? Like, does it represent what we see in reality? And that's what we're going to look at in the context of international trade, okay? We're going to look at that next.
But let's have a look at part two, which is the international trade and local gravity. I'm going to show you how international trade would uh, effect, be affected by local gravity. Uh, some people write this off as insignificant, you know, like it wouldn't have much of an effect. But, you know, if <laughs> in the context of international trade, once I show you the figures, I think you'll see that it would have a big impact. Okay, so I did some econometric uh, research. Okay, uh, I looked up, you know, gravity and its effect on international trade, and I only come up with a few articles here and there, and they basically don't even talk about gravity as such, other than as a constant. So they don't even look at it at a local level. They're more interested in like distance, distance and costs to do with importing, okay? As some of the main reasons why they don't, uh, it, it, it shows to be uh, a bit smaller than in, intracontinental trade, okay? Um, there are other factors. For instance, in Malaysia, you know, for a while they stopped uh, importing our poultry because of the bird flu. And there are other, you know, reasons, you know, like the US had a bit of a scandal with two suppliers uh, when supplying real halal beef and so they preferred to buy from Australia okay whereas you get other countries that will prefer to buy from the US because you know their beefs probably two dollars US uh, cheaper than Australian meat so there's all sorts of different uh, factors that need to be looked at but one of them you, uh, that would need to be looked at if it was true would be uh, local gravity and its effect. Okay, now as you have a look on here, it shows you his references that he uses. And one of interest to me is uh, uh, there's one here uh, to do with uh, the gravity data, right? And so I looked up this gravity data thing. Okay, as you can see, I have done a lot of research and it, and it talks about the gravity and uh, it talks more about the distance and the amount of the bean export and stuff. It's got nothing to do with actual gravity <laughs> okay so this is actually new territory i'm breaking new territory i'm a pioneer in this yeah uh, so hopefully if you want to you want to talk about local gravity and inter and its effect on international trade you can come to this video this is it but i'm going to show you how it doesn't all right how it does not affect international trade mainly because it's it's not doesn't even exist okay it's bullshit all right, but anyway, so it talks about the trade flow and economic mass of each country and the distance, and it says treats, treats G as a constant, all right? So, so I looked at, um, started looking at our meat exports, all right? And as you can see, here's all the different lamb and mutton and beef. I looked at uh, all the different countries that we export to. Then I looked at carrots and all sorts of stuff. I've done a fair bit of reading so anyone who says i don't know what i'm talking about uh, just have a look at what i've looked at right you you have a look at it yourself and you uh see if uh i even looked at buffaloes right so i start off with a cow i thought beef yeah we'll look at beef exports and so i looked at uh i even looked at shipping routes right this is an interactive one and it shows that there's a lot of international trade. It's actually going against their own uh, their own thesis. They're saying there's no not much international trade. This is showing a lot, okay? And uh, you can even look this all up yourself, and it's pretty cool. All right, so um, uh, they say there's a 0.5% weight difference between the equator and the poles. So if we divide that by uh, 90 degrees, we get 0 0.00005555556 of a kilogram weight difference per degree of latitude. If you're wondering how I came up with that, well, I just multiply one kilogram by 0.5%, uh, right? And you, you're left with, uh, it gives us five grams, okay? And uh, if you divide the... Uh, uh, five grams by 90 degrees, you get 0 0.00055556 of a kilogram per degree of latitude, all right, between the equator and the, either pole, all right, and why is this? Because local gravity, moo, <laughs> all right, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, anyway, we'll look at Charlieville, 
and Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta, right? I take the uh, latitudes of uh, Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta and I subtract them from Charleville, which is in um, Queensland, all right? And then what I do is I uh, multiply them by uh, uh, the 0, 0.00005555556, which gives you the difference, uh, latitude, latitudinal variation uh, of, of, a ki of a kilogram, all right? And then I looked at the meat sales to Malaysia and then to Indonesia in tons. I uh, then converted them into uh, um, kilograms later, but I show how I divided by 365.25 days to show you how many kilograms per day, right? And then I did the math, and I showed I sh did the math to show the difference uh, between. Uh, how much it weighs in Australia and how much it weighs in Jakarta and Kuala Lumpur, uh, respectively, right? And then I did the maths to show how much they uh, lost per day, <laughs> per day. And then I have a look at this, all right? If you can see the tons that it weighs, how much it weighs in Australia and how much it weighs in Kuala Lumpur or Jakarta, there is a problem. They're, they're missing some tons. So let's put it in economic terms, right, for the, a loss for the year. Uh, as you can see, uh, one's lost $95,000 worth and, and uh, the other's lost uh, about $263,000 worth, right, over the course of the year. All right, and all because of local gravity. <laughs> Moo. <laughs> I call bullshit, okay? It's rubbish. All right. Anyway, so I looked at uh, lamb as well as uh, mutton, right? Because uh, it wasn't giving me the figures I was after that I thought would be persuasive. Okay. And I did also over a five-year period to try and get some bigger figures. All right. Then I uh, looked even into wheat and um, tried to look over that. And then poultry over a five-year period. And uh, then I uh, even looked at buffalo, which I talked about earlier, and um, and then even uh, seafood. <laughs> I looked at our seafood exports, okay? Mm. And uh, then I looked at the goat export, which seems to be increasing, and uh, sugar even. But even that wasn't giving me enough, so I went for carrots. All right, looked at carrots. I looked all, uh, at this over a five-year period. And uh, also from uh, different places like Papua New Guinea and Singapore, etc. So it wasn't just uh, Jakarta and, and uh, Kuala Lumpur. And it still wasn't giving me the numbers I, I thought would be persuasive. So I, I thought gold. <laughs> All right. That was my next thought. Try gold. So we're going to have a look at the international gold export data, right? We're going to look at... Um, Export between UK and Switzerland, then Switzerland and China, Switzerland and Hong Kong, Switzerland and India, Switzerland and Thailand, Switzerland and Singapore, and Switzerland and the UAE. And I got this data from the uh, goldcharts.com website, okay? So I've got all the latitudes here of the capital cities. Uh, could have could have used uh, Shanghai instead of Beijing, but I thought Beijing gives me a smaller number. You know, Shanghai being f further away from Switzerland would give us a bigger number. So I went for Beijing, all right? So the method for calculating the local gravity, right, and the impact of it on, uh, on international trade, I'd take the latitude of the exporter and subtract the latitude of the importer, right? In this case, uh, UK, uh, uh, and we subtract the um, latitude of Switzerland, we get 5.17. Five seven, and then we, and we multiply the by the weight variation, right, of zero 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 five 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 six per degree of latitude, and th it comes to this number that I multiply by the dollar amount, which which gives me the loss incurred over those five months. Okay, and then I multiply the net weight of the gold exported in kilograms by an average price per kilogram of fifty three thousand three hundred fifty dollars AUD, and I multiply the amounts paid by latitude variation calculated to find the loss. And then finally I add loss from gold e export transactions for each month to find the total. 
Now, we have a look at this. This is where I got the uh, information for price per kilo, $53,350. Um, it was higher. So I went with the lower number. So now I could say I used too high a number, okay? All right. So let's do some freaking mass. All right, let's do this. Okay, so... Looking at the transactions between UK and Switzerland, starting from November 2016. Uh, in November, they exported 46,100 kilograms. And we multiply that by the dollar amount, and we get a loss of $707,000, right? Mm. Okay. And then we go to December. There's 151,900 kilograms. Multiply that by that dollar amount, and, and then we do the mass, and it gives us a... Uh, a loss of uh, over 2 million, right? 2.3 million, okay? Then we look at January 2017, uh, exported 84,400 uh, kilograms of gold, all right? And that gives us a, a nice loss of uh, $1.2 million uh, worth, all right? Then we look at February 2017, 30,700 kilograms of gold right multiply all that and do all the mass and it gives us a four hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollar loss okay for that month and then we look at march twenty five thousand six hundred kilograms of gold was exported we do the mass and uh it, it gives us a pretty big loss of three hundred ninety two thousand seven hundred nine thousand dollars right for that month Okay, so if we were to do the total, it comes to five million one hundred ninety-five thousand seven hundred twenty-nine dollars point eight zero two three loss incurred by Switzerland <laughs> over five months due to imaginary local gravity. Okay, <laughs> five million bucks. All right, but let's suspend our judgment for the moment and uh, take a look at the gold exported by Switzerland to the six countries I mentioned earlier. Okay, so uh, we'll get. Uh, a fairly decent amount when we add all this up so we look at switzerland to china there you go that's how i worked out our um the the weight difference between the two latitudes right um by subtracting china's latitude from switzerland's and then multiplying that by the latitudinal uh, weight variation right so in november to china Switzerland exported 30,100 kilograms, all right, which gives them a $573,000 loss. Okay, it doesn't sound much. All right, but let's have a look at December. This is because of Chinese New Year. <laughs> so anyway, in December, the gold exporter was 154,100 kilograms, and it gave them a $2.9 million loss in that month okay just that month alone all right so then we go to january 2017 17,800 kilograms with a three three hundred and thirty nine thousand and ninety seven dollar loss right and then we go to february it's twenty one thousand five hundred kilograms uh exported which gives you a four hundred nine point five thousand dollar loss for that month and we go to March, 24,000 kilograms of gold exported, which equates to a uh, $457,000 loss for that month. And the total loss for the five-month period was over $4 million, right? $4.7 million incurred by China over five months due to imaginary local gravity, okay? And then we look at Switzerland to Hong Kong, November. 44,400, right? Which gives you a $3.1 uh, uh, million loss. Okay. Then we'll look at December. It's 38,900 kilograms were sold, which gives you a $2.7 million loss. All right. December was uh, a bad time for Hong Kong. Then we'll look at January 2017. 21,600 21, kilograms, which is a $1.539 uh, million dollar loss to Hong Kong okay then we look at February there's uh, 7,200 kilograms that were sold as uh, $513,000 loss in February 
Okay, so not having a good good uh, five months. In March, 24,300 kilograms of gold was exported, which gave a $1.7 million loss to Hong Kong. Okay, big loss. So if we we add all these losses for the five-month period, we end up with a $9,720,910 uh, dollar loss incurred by Hong Kong over five months due to imaginary local gravity. Okay. Now let's look at India. November, we get 61,300 kilograms, which gave them a $3.2 million loss on weight. Okay, December was 21,100 kilograms, which gives them a $1.1 million loss for that month. <laughs> all right, we're talking big numbers here, much bigger than beef, all right? Then we look at January 2017, 26,400 kilograms of gold exported, and we get a $1.3 million loss for that month, okay? That's a pretty big loss for that month. But uh, you might have thought that, given those losses, that India um, would stop importing gold from Switzerland. But let's continue with the figures for February and March, shall we? Okay. So we have a look at February. 37,200 uh, kilograms exported, which gave them a $1.9 million loss. Okay, and then we get March, all right, 55,600 kilograms of gold exported, which gave them a $2.9 million loss, approximately, all right, using those figures. So a total loss of for India is $10,586,748.3251 uh, loss incurred by India over five months due to imaginary local gravity. That's a big loss. Okay, let's uh, look at Switzerland to Thailand. In November, there was 4,500 kilograms of gold uh, exported with a loss of uh, $434,000 worth, right? Then in December, there was 10,200 kilograms exported with a $984,000 loss, okay? Um, which is pretty big for Thailand, poor Thailand, right? And then in January 2017, there was 13,800 kilograms of gold exported with a $1.3 million loss. Yeah, that's right, $1.3 million loss for Thailand. All right, then we look at February, there was 3,400 kilograms exported, which gave them a $328,000 loss for that month. All right, then we look into March. There was 3,600 kilograms of gold exported, which gave them a $349,000 loss, okay? So when we uh, add that all up, we get a total loss for those five months of $3,429,151.7599 loss incurred by Thailand over five months due to imaginary local gravity, okay? All right, let's look at the gold exported to Singapore. In November, there was 10,100 kilograms of gold, uh, which led to a $1.3 million loss on their behalf in November, okay? Then in December, there's 22,900 kilograms of gold exported, which gave them a $3 million loss. All right, $3 million, okay? It's not a drop in the ocean. All right, then we've got January 2017, there's 13,600 kilograms of gold exported and it gave them a $1.8 million loss, right? For January. <laughs> Poor Singapore. Then we go to February and there was 2,800 kilograms exported, right? Which gave them a $373,794 loss, okay? Then we go to March, there was 6,100 uh, kilograms of gold exported, which gave them and uh, $814,000 loss for that month. So if we add all the five months together, we get a $7,409,133.4895 loss incurred by Singapore over five months due to imaginary local gravity. All right, let's go to the UAE. It's not as much, but November they, they, they exported 2,400 kilograms of gold, which gave them $149,000 loss, okay? And then uh, December, 6,100 kilograms of gold exported, which gave them a $380,000 loss for that month, all right, in December. All right, then we move over to January, 
and we get a 3,700 kilograms of gold was exported, which led to a $230,000 loss for that month. All right. They don't seem to export as much as the other countries. Then we go to February. Uh, 1,900 kilograms of gold, right, which gave them a $118,000 loss for that month. Then we move over to March, and we, we've got 3,100 kilograms of gold exported, which gives them a $193,000 loss for that month. Okay, poor UAE. Then we add all those together, and they get a $1,073,346.3 0.7332 loss incurred by UAE over five months due to imaginary local gravity. Okay, let's recap the losses. If we add all them up, it gives us uh, $42,129,868.08015, right? <laughs> loss due to a local imaginary gravity, right? Uh, why did they suffer that much loss? All right, what caused local gravity? <laughs> uh, rubbish. <laughs> I call bullshit, okay? No such thing as local gravity, all right? Nicola Tesla said, Today scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Okay, and that seems to be the case here, uh, especially with the IGF and the FAC. They don't bear any resemblance to reality, all right? So I call bullshit. Okay, it's all bullshit. It doesn't work. Now, the reason why I've updated uh, this video is uh, because um, on the on the the other video, uh, someone uh, kindly pointed out that um, the mass in regards to the um, IGF and the uh, FAC uh, wasn't right. That I'd um, misread it. Now, on on my part, it wasn't a deliberate misrepresentation you know I just uh, in the hustle and bustle of trying to put things together I just um, yeah I didn't look into it enough and uh, but I am thankful for people who are willing to point out where I've gone wrong and I'm willing to admit that you know it's in the uh, name of uh, intellectual honesty and integrity uh, I'm willing to admit uh, when I've made a mistake so that's cool and uh, yeah, they weren't able to find uh, any any problems with the uh, rest of the video. So I'm pretty happy <laughs> that only you know, a 50 minutes of video they they could only find fault with about four minutes of it. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's good. Still doesn't take away from the fact that um, you know, even if it does uh, do a good job of uh, representing um, the theory, it doesn't necessarily uh, represent reality um, as we can see from um, how international trade uh, especially the gold trade would be affected by this okay uh, there would be a huge loss incurred uh, in international trade um, if if there was such thing as local gravity okay local uh, international trade would not even uh, exist because there'd be too much loss incurred on top of the transport fees and and you know everything to do with costs and uh, import duties and stuff it just wouldn't happen okay i mean no one would want to do international trade right uh, if, if it was going to cause this much loss so i'd say that's totally debunked all right now, that's why I, I concentrated on this particular aspect. I mean, I could have tried to debunk NASA, right? I mean, you look at this guy in the ISS, right? He's got, he's on his treadmill and he's got this thing, harness holding him down because he doesn't want to fly off or anything like that. But then you, you have a look at that pair of scissors, right? <laughs> it seems to be defying gravity. What's the point, you know? That thing should be flying up and hitting him in the nuts, okay? And then you got this guy, he's, he's on the ISS, and uh, <laughs> it's moving at 170,000 miles per hour, apparently, in orbit, <laughs> yet as he's not phased at all, is he? He just seems to be, like, waving, saying, hi there, you know. And then you got this guy who's actually uh, trying to maintain, do some maintenance on the I ISS. I mean, if I could get someone 
to <laughs> do maintenance on my car while I'm travelling at 110 kilometres per hour, I'd be happy, right? I could have debunked the heliocentric model, you know. I mean, you have a look at this picture here and it's the helical. Uh, see how, how, how it's not to scale. I mean, it's all science fiction. It's not real, mate. I mean, look at it. It's not even to scale, okay <laughs> it's not even realistic even this one it's it's not realistic i mean it's not even to, it's definitely not to scale this one's not to scale and it's showing a little planet going in front of the sun which would be obliterated and look at this look at look at how they try to ascribe it how close that that planet would be to the sun <laughs> it's not even to scale it's not realistic it doesn't describe reality whereas you have a look at my picture here uh that's actually to scale. There's the little sun on the left and the even smaller Earth. That's how f how much distance there would be between it. And then I could have debunked uh, Don Petit, right? Now he reckons that we can't go to the moon anymore. We used to be able to, but we can't because uh, uh, the technology was destroyed, right? <laughs> He's basically admitting that they're not as smart as the NASA scientists of the 1960s who put this piece of shit on the moon, right? <laughs> all right, and he says it's all it's all cause technology, okay? <laughs> he says the technology was lost and destroyed, okay? <laughs> they're not as smart as they used to be, okay? That's bullshit, okay? Absolute bullshit. I call bullshit on this one. I could have debunked Einstein's relativity. All right. I could have had a real go. I, was, uh, I might do that next next video. And even the idea that the the, the closest stars are like forty trillion kilometers away from us. I could could have debunked that. Even though <laughs> you know this apparent satellite picture or two of them uh, show the stars between the satellite and and earth <laughs> some people will say it's space junk but this is black and white rubbish <laughs> okay <laughs> oh it's because they're fixed these stars are fixed right <laughs> even though they're, <laughs> they're still moving with us anyway if you have a look at this i decided to do this one experiment if you have a look what I've done, I've got a container, just a microwave container, I've put water in it, I've tilted it by putting one end on another, the other end of a, on, on, a, on another smaller uh, container, and as you can see, I've, <laughs> if you can see what I'm trying to do here, you'll understand, I mean, I've, I've got a, a shaker top, a shaker lid off my Himalayan rock salt, right, <laughs> it's just sitting on top of the water, it's not moving. I mean, you'd think that, you know, if uh, water does sort of uh, conform to a convex shape or to a tilt, then this thing would just be flowing, but it's not. It's level. That's right. Water maintains its level. It seeks it's the lowest place and then it maintains its level. All right, it finds its level. That's why they call it sea level and not sea curvature. Okay. Yeah, don't be stupid. <laughs> Look at that, it's not even moving. I've had it for over a minute, and it's just sitting there, level. Alright? It's level as. It's more level than than my face, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I just had to put that joke in there. My face isn't very level at all. It's close, but it's not close. It doesn't get the gold medal. <laughs> so all in all, I, there's a lot of things I could have, you know, used to debunk. Uh, the globe birth, but I thought, you know, the gold export would do it, all right? I mean, you just have a look at the figures, all right? $42 million loss over a five-month period. That's a lot of money, okay? So look into Flat Earth yourself. Look into uh, people who have uh, uh, put out different videos. Have a look at them. Do some research for yourself. Have a look at curvature, or look for curvature, the fake curvature, right? And I just want to thank you for watching, okay? Peace out.